All right. Good morning and welcome to all our internet listeners who are joining our church today. We're continuing in our exposition of the Gospel of John and today we reach the culmination, that's exactly right, of the six trials, Jesus went through six trials of the Lord that he suffered at the hands of sinful man on that fatal Wednesday and now it is morning of course. For within hours Jesus would be crucified on the cross at 9 a.m. Uh, this would be Roman time at that. Now John's Gospel gives us the details of the terrible ordeal of punishments that Jesus went through and of course the coming death at the hands of the Jews and the Romans who participated through Pilate uh, calling for his crucifixion. But we have this all on video which is always very interesting to watch a, enacted scenes of the Gospel of John. We've been going all the way through the Gospel of John for those who might be listening for the first time or so or early on. And uh, let's take a look now and see this and then we'll open it up from the scriptures to see what God has to say and how it's applicable to you and to all of us here today. Here we go. John chapter 19 verses 1 to 16. Then Pilate went back outside to the people and said to them, I cannot find any reason to condemn him, but... According to the custom you have, I always set free a prisoner for you during the Passover. Do you want me to set free for you? the king of the Jews? They answered him with a shout. Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. Look, here is the man. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. He will not speak to me. Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. You have authority over me. 
Only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. If you set him free, that means you are not the Emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the Emperor. heard these words, he took Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the Stone Pavement. In Hebrew, the name is Gabbatha. It was then almost noon of the day before the Passover. Pilate said to the people, Here is your king. Kill him. Do you want me to crucify your king? The only king we have is the emperor. <laughs> then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Okay, it's a long one, but really important. Let's have a prayer. Father God, as we watch this uh, video enactment of the scriptures itself that we're studying today, this is something that should touch every heart as we watch and see that our God and Savior went to a cross to die for the sins of the world. And those sins of the world included ours, Lord. And because of that, we are free through Christ's uh, birth and uh, rebirth. And I just pray, Father, that each and every one of us here that he gives that rebirth to, uh, will indeed uh, learn something from the scripture today. And all those listening, perhaps online, who have yet to receive Jesus Christ, have not surrendered their lives or the will, their soul, I pray today that they'll see Jesus clearly and they'll know that he is the one that is their savior and their God. I pray this in Jesus' most wonderful name, amen. All right, we're gonna talk about the prior events of the crucifixion, John chapter 19, verses 1 to 16. On the screen, I'm going to put on uh, the outline which you have in your hands here. Uh, we're going to look at four things. Pilate's cruel punishments, uh, Pilate's continual pleading, Pilate's complete panic, and of course, Pilate's complicit participation in uh, the whole thing. When I was putting these uh, outlines together, it came real easy for me because it kind of divided itself in the same fashion as you see right here. Now again, we're going to run into some problems in the scripture today, and I'm going to explain it very clearly, but nonetheless, what helps us is to understand that we do not function on the same timing that was going on in the first century. Here's a chart, uh, courtesy of Michael Hunt of Agape Bible Study. He put this together, uh, but it shows Roman time and it shows Jewish time. Now, I did put in red there the area of time that we're studying right now, and that is that period of the completion of Pilate's trial. That ran somewhere, and now this is approximate, between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. 
But again, uh, because Roman time is used in the scripture and Jewish or biblical time is used in the scripture uh, and translators choose their opinion as to which belongs in what passage has created complete confusion over things. But as I said, we're going to study it and we're going to make it clear. All right, let's begin with the first verse of chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1 said, Then Pilate took Jesus and he had him flogged. Now, the trial actually should have ended here because Pilate declared that he was innocent. If he was innocent, why was he flogged? You don't flog someone who is innocent. So there's a little problem right there. But the worst part was how could the, uh, the crowd choose uh, the evil, worthless, most dangerous man named Barabbas in that time to be released in the Passover season for the custom that apparently they had uh, that the uh, Romans honored about the Jewish people. So Pilate probably thought, maybe there's a chance for them to agree with me that he is innocent if maybe I have him roughed up a bit, okay? So this is what Pilate decided to do. And that being roughed up is a very mild word for what Jesus went through. But maybe they would change their minds, right? So then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, after they see Jesus brutally beaten within an inch of his life, will they have compassion? Will the Jews have sympathy? The point here is Roman flogging uh, or scourging, as it was called, is about the worst that you could do to the human body. I looked this up and uh, someone had created this drawing, and I think it gives an idea. Roman scourging was the worst thing that could happen to any person. They used the flagrum, it's called, and it's a whip. But on the end of the whip, they uh, uh, weave in five strands that are about probably 18 to 24 inches long. And on these strands, they loop in pieces of uh, lead. And in between the pieces of lead, they would put sheep's bones, uh, sharp sheep's bones in there. So that when they whipped a person on the back, uh, the, the uh, lead balls, if you want to call them that lead portion there, would, would break up uh, the skin and then the bones would get in and carve out flesh and take it away with the whip. So the victim was stripped bare and it wasn't just his back. It was his buttocks and his legs and his arms. And as they show here, they hung him high enough so that he couldn't stand and support himself and maybe wiggle around. They had him hanging so that there was nothing they could do but lay there against that post. And deep stripes were cut into the body, removing flesh, as I said, and muscle, which was accompanied by considerable blood loss in there. Now, these acts inflicted unbearable pain, pain to the point where usually the victim fainted. But with the next whip, they were revived again. And then they fainted again, and they were revived again. I can't even imagine uh, how bad uh, this was for what uh, Jesus suffered there. Many died from the brutal Roman scourgings, by the way, due to blood loss, trauma, and shock. Uh, no form of punishment could be more painful. So the victim, as I said, fainted. Now, Jesus suffered this first brutal uh, pain, but he was to suffer even more than that. First, he suffered the, fallen, the wrath of fallen sinful man who wanted no rule of God's son in their life. But then when he went to the cross, he suffered from God, the wrath of God against the sinfulness of man, which was poured out into Jesus for you and me. And so I can't even imagine what that was as well. But now verse two, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. The better word is they rammed it into his skull and they clothed him with a purple robe. Last week, remember, he went before Herod and Herod had him clothed. He didn't want him standing there naked before him. So they took one of, I guess, Pilate's old discarded robes. That's the only thing I can assume. And they covered him with it. So here came the robe. They took the robe off, of, car, of course, as shown in that picture, to make sure that these beatings and the scourging covered not only his back, but his buttocks and his legs. So the pain was all up his legs, on the backs of his arms and his uh, neck and so forth there. But I tell you, I can only 
minutely imagine what this was like uh, last week when I went to the, the emergency ward and the doctor took uh, 12 needles and stuck it into my head uh, with lidocaine, see? Well, that's fine, but the lidocaine didn't take effect when he was stabbing me in the head. And I mean, it was gross uh, at that. But that's nothing to what Jesus felt when these crown of thorns with, you know, two-inch thorns were rammed right into his skull, embedded deeply there. So you can imagine, and I can't imagine, why would the Creator God himself, who created all mankind when he became a man, go to this cross and suffer this from the hands of fallen, sinful, evil men? Well, I don't know, but Jesus did suffer that for you and for me. Now look at verse 3. And the soldiers went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. A better word is punched him in the face, right? And they, de they just kept doing this very thing. This was a barbaric act, which was all part of the deep humiliation that Jesus suffered on your behalf and mine. And of course, Jesus identified with human sin as the servant of the Lord. You know, Matthew and Mark talk about this and they added continuously that the soldiers also spit on his face and they kept spitting on him. And they took the crown of thorns and they smashed it. They kept smashing it into his, his head. Now, Pilate had hoped that this scourging would be severe enough and marring his body and his flesh so that they would see this and they would have sympathy for him but when they brought him out, they had no sympathy at all. They wanted his teachings. They wanted his rulership. They wanted the very being of Christ out of their sight forever. And they wanted him to be destroyed. So he had to die. And for them, he had to die hard for showing them all their sins. This brings us to Pilate's continual pleading in verses 4 to 7. Take a look. Once more Pilate came out and he said to the Jews gathered there, Look, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Again, how ridiculous. They, he finds no basis and brings him out totally beaten and marred uh, for this very thing here. But it was in a way Pilate's thought of maybe getting him off the hook of being uh, crucified. So he said, when he came out, he made this statement, here is the man. Behold, the King James says, behold the man. I like that. That's a better translation in, in my opinion. He was saying, look, look at him now. He is so violently injured. He is abused. And this true evidence, of course, was showing nonetheless the monstrous act of Pilate himself and his cowardice in the face of the Jewish leaders. But he was hoping as people would look at this man so brutally beaten, that they would have some form of sympathy here. So this was a graphic illustration, really, by his statement, behold the man here. Now, as I was going through the synoptic gospels here, I found that there were seven times Pilate asked for this man to be released. Let me give you them. Number one, he said in John 18, 38, I find no fault in this man. Number two, Pilate was therefore willing to release Jesus, Luke 23, verse 20. The third time, I will let him go, he said in Luke 23, 22, and they kept crying, no, give us Barabbas in his place. And then number four, Pilate sought to release him, John 19, uh, verse 12. And number five, Pilate sought the Jews to take Barabbas instead, John 18, 39 to uh, 40. And then number five, or six, I should say, Pilate was urged by his wife's dream. Remember, Matthew 27, 19 said that his wife had a terrible dream and pleaded with him to release Jesus. And one more, John 18, 31, take him yourselves. Remember, he said that in the film, and judge him. So we must realize uh, Pilate simply wanted here uh, this to be over. That's all he really wanted. He didn't care about Jesus at all. He wanted to get on with his life. Remember, this was a holiday time period here, the Passover. So everything was kind of quiet and Pilate was going to have an easy time. So maybe he was going to have a barbecue, right? With his wife or something in the afternoon of this uh, uh, great Passover event. He wanted to go back and not be bothered by this thing here. So Pilate's scourging was clearly that 
he cared less about Jesus Christ. Now verses 5, we'll go over again, and then verse 6. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and officials saw him, that is Jesus, what did they do? They cried out, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, No, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. So this was actually the final attempt to touch the hearts of the Jews. When Jesus came out, you have to understand this, he was a walking, bleeding, living corpse. That's exactly what he was. And earlier, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So normally, anyone who would be beaten as badly as he would, they would have died on that post. Uh, they would have already been gone, but not Jesus, because it was not time to release his spirit from his body. So keep that in mind. Now, in addition to that, when, uh, when Pilate said, Behold the man, look at him, he says, Look what I have done to him. Isn't that enough, right? As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they didn't shout sympathy. They shouted, Kill him, crucify him. You take him and crucify him. But, you know, they couldn't do that because the Romans had taken away the power uh, for them to do that. So with that in mind here, uh, some of the translators say when Pilate himself saw Jesus come out, he was aghast when he looked at this man coming out here. Jesus was so visibly marred, his face was swollen and unrecognizable. His body was physically ruined and bleeding you could not recognize him as a person. He was but a blob of bloody, torn, mutilated flesh. And you know, that's exactly what the Bible says because the Bible predicted this very thing from Isaiah 52, verse 4. Notice what it says. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. You and I can't imagine that, but that's what they did to Jesus, and yet he was still standing and walking. Why did they do this? Why did Pilate order it? Why did these Roman soldiers who were vicious, bloodthirsty men, uh, they did it because of their hatred of who Jesus was. And remember, the demons were there, and the demons were inciting the Roman soldiers, inciting the crowd, everyone, to kill Jesus and mar him for that very thing. Now, the question arises, someone once asked me this some years ago, did the beatings and the punishment of Christ by the Romans contribute to the payment uh, of uh, our sins? And the answer is no. You know, I think it was back in 2004, Mel Gibson did a film entitled about this, The Passion of Christ. You may have seen it, I don't know. Uh, but in this, he emphasized the brutality of the Romans uh, against Jesus beyond anything you could imagine here. And probably that's about as bad as it really got in real life. But Jesus did not suffer the punishment of the Romans for your sins. Because remember, the punishment of Jesus by the Romans was sin. So how can sin pay for sin? It was not for that very purpose. But I'll get back to that firmly and uh, me mention that it did not do that. Now look at verse 7. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, Jesus must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, that would be true. Jesus would have committed blasphemy if he weren't God. But he was God come in flesh. He proved that by his miracles and the things that he did, even raising Lazarus from the dead. No man could do these things except the Creator God himself. So he didn't break the law. But nonetheless, they appealed to the law of God. They wanted to be sure that the law of God would be upheld. Really? Were they following the law of God? The only thing that will cause the sinner uh, in this situation here to obey the law of God is if we do that according to God's word. They were going to have this man lynched, if we could use that term in a sense here, on uh, a cross. 
they were not obeying the law of God themselves. Now, sometimes people think, well, you know, the law of God is really something that we don't need to preach to people. We need to preach grace. We need to preach, uh, preach love of God. How many churches today preach the love of God, hoping people will get saved? I got news for you. Just as those uh, uh, cruel, evil uh, soldiers did not get saved by beating Jesus, the love of God, the uh, love of God will never lead anyone to the cross. The only thing that will lead people to the cross is the law of God. Now you think about that. The law must first be preached to a sinner before the love of God could be understood and accepted. Now where do we find the law of God? We find it in the Bible. We find it specifically in the books of Leviticus, and we find it specifically culminated, embodied, whatever word you want to use, in what are called the Ten Commandments. Some time ago I taught the whole Ten Commandments. Uh, it's online, folks, if you still want to see it and read it and listen to it as well. But nonetheless, the law of God. Whatever happened to the Ten Commandments? I said that once before. But you know what Isaiah said? He said, shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people uh, the word is sins, their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob, their sins. So in other words, that's what God wants us to do. How do you declare someone's sins without declaring the law of God? Now, whatever happened to it, I really don't know. But, you know, some time ago there was a big uh, uh, brouhaha over this thing. And when people, even in our town here in Grand Junction, uh, when a uh, monument was put up with the Ten Commandments, People were all upset over this thing and said that it was wrong. It was a great detriment to society. It was dishonoring other religions. And some people even said that when they went by, they suffered an emotional breakdown looking at the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, that's good that they suffered an emotional breakdown because that's exactly what God wants you to experience. Now, think about that. Uh, how bad is it? What are the Ten Commandments? Well, I want to share with you what the Ten Commandments for the church today is and how we can put it in the colloquialism of our words today. Let me go over them. It's very small on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you, all right? The first commandment, make God first place in one's life and no one and nothing else. If you have not done that, you've broken the first commandment. Number two, God said, make nothing into an idol you'll desire or spend time with more than God. I think all of us at one time or another, or even right now, are breaking the second commandment. The third one, don't misuse the name of God frivolously or cursing that does not glorify God. Even expressions like, oh God, this is using and misusing the name of God. So many people have broken the third commandment. Here's the fourth commandment. Once in every week, publicly worship God and cease your regular worship. Or regular work, I mean. That's right. God says, I want to see you once a week gathered with other saints worshiping me. And if you don't do that, you are breaking the uh, commandments. Now, number five, honor your parents in your speech and take all forms of care of them always. That means even until the grave, you are responsible for your parents and to show that love. Number six, don't commit murder. How? In or by thoughts, nor physical acts save self-defense. That's right. Even thinking someone to be dead, as these uh, uh, Roman, uh, not Roman, Jewish leaders did, they broke uh, the uh, sixth commandment. Now, number seven, don't have or seek any sexual gratification outside of marriage. That leaves no room for anything gratifying the sexual aspect of your humanity. Within marriage, God blesses it. All right, next, number eight. Don't steal or cheat or ever be dishonest in anything at any time. Number nine, don't lie or give false testimony anywhere or at any time. And don't lust or have any lingering desires for anyone or anything others have. Those are the Ten Commandments. I don't know about you, but I can just go over that list and even this week I broke the Ten Commandments. In fact, I broke one of those commandments where God stuck me right in my... Uh, had the sore spot uh, th this morning as I was going over the message and I had to pray and say, Lord, forgive me, I, I'm going to make that right. So in other words, think about that. 
But the question is, you can use the Ten Commandments to anyone and say, if you think you're right with God, tell me, which one of these commandments have you not broken? And indeed we have. But you know what God says, James 2.10? For the person who keeps all the laws except one is guilty as a person who has broken all of God's law. It's the old story. A chain is as strong as the weakest link. And so God wants us to realize this very thing. And what is the punishment for breaking even just one of these commandments just once in your entire life? Because you know what God's goal is? Everyone must have 100% perfection like God. Oh, you'll throw up your hands and say, who can do that? That's right. None of us can do that. And that's why we need a savior. That's why we need someone to take our place, to pay for the sins that we will pay for. Romans 6, 23 says very simply here, the judgment of sin is death. That's right. And the Jewish leaders cried out, we have a law. Oh, really? Well, they better look right in the mirror because they have broken God's law. Now again, Pilate's continual pleading in verse 7. The Jewish leaders insisted he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. So they broke the sixth commandment, which was to murder another person. They wanted Rome to kill Jesus for them here. Pilate lost all attempts at seeking their grace and mercy. And you know why? Because sinners don't have any grace and mercy. Now, this brought Pilate to complete panic in verses 8 to 11. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. John doesn't tell us specifically that Pilate was fearful before verse 8. He tells us right now it was. And it seems obvious because their predicament uh, reached the point of fear. Let me give you four reasons why. Number one, he had compromised his position as Rome's representative and was considering to free Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist. Rome didn't let these kind of people go free. It may be, uh, you know, a petty theft, a uh, thief or something like that, but not Barabbas. He was not really allowed to go free. Number two, he had displeased and alienated himself with the Jewish leaders. His job as governor was to keep the peace. His job was to keep everybody happy in Jerusalem there. Number three, he feared for his own place in Rome because it looked like a riot was brewing. And if a riot broke out, you know what? Tiberius, uh, the emperor, would have done away with Pilate and put someone in his place to take care. And number four, you know what he did? He really feared Jesus. You see, the Romans at this point in time believed there were demigods. You know what a demigod was? A demigod was someone who looked human, but they really weren't human. But they had supernatural powers, and they could carry out those supernatural powers against people or for people, whatever they chose. So he believed that Jesus was a demigod because he had this power of uh, miracle powers. And he feared that Jesus might turn on him if he went to execute him. In fact, that's what his wife warned in a dream. She had a dream of that very thing. Now look at verses 9 and 10. And so Pilate went back inside the palace, and he had Jesus there, and he brought him to himself, and he said, Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus would not answer that question. And the answer is because Jesus, number one, had actually answered it before in John chapter 18, verses 36 to 37. But moreover, uh, Peter later used this as an example for suffering Christians. God has said that you too, if you faced uh, trials and tribulations and abuse from people because of your Christianity, don't strike back. Don't answer them. Just go through these things and suffer for Jesus' sake. So, do you realize, Pilate said now, I have power. Don't you realize, verse uh, 10, I have the power to either free you or to crucify you. Now, we went over that before. Nobody had any power against Jesus unless God gave them that very poor power. Luke writes in the book of Acts that Christ was delivered up uh, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2, verse 23. So he didn't have any power. He thought he had, but nonetheless, he told Jesus that. Now look at verse uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, right? And indeed, yet he opened not his mouth. That's important to think about that very thing there. He was silent before his uh, shearers here. Now verse 11. 
Jesus finally answered and he said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. I just stated that in Luke chapter 3, uh, verse 23. So Jesus reminded Pilate that it was only delegated power to him. One day the Almighty God would call Pilate to account for what he had used and abused of his privileges and responsibilities, particularly with Jesus, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Now, although Pilate will be judged for ruling to crucify Jesus, who was he referring to here? Think about that very thing. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you. Therefore, the one who handed me over is guilty of greatest sin. Who is this one? Well, we think about it. It could be Judas, right? He's the one who handed Jesus over. It could be Satan. Satan organized the whole thing. It could be Annas who accused him and Caiaphas who accused him or the whole Roman Sanhedrin, uh, Jewish Sanhedrin that accused him or even the Jewish people who out there were crying, give us a Barabbas and crucify him. Who is the one who handed me over to you and is guilty of greater sin? I think the answer is all of them. And in the all of them includes you and me, because we too, in our sinful fallen nature, did not want Jesus to rule over us. And if possible, we would have had him crucified as well. So everyone, before they can ever get to the place of being saved, has to get to the place of being lost before they can be saved. And that's where the law of God comes in. And that's why I said to you before, indeed, we have to preach the law of God to people, and then they can come to understand this. Now, in this complicit participation, look at verse uh, 12. But before I do that, I had Romans 13 there. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authority that exists have been established by God. So, you know, Paul talks about it. Jesus spoke about it. And you and I need to get it strongly in our mind. Nothing is going to go on in America. Nothing is going to go on in our lives without God's expressed approval. And when John ex uh, God expresses approval for things that don't seem to be good for us, then we have to know he's going to use it to turn it around to bring good for us and to bring him glory. And that's where our faith comes in for that very thing. Now remember, where did, uh, where did Pilate take Jesus? He went out to the pavement, as it was called, and in the pavement there, uh, he uh, was going to judge Jesus. Take a look. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Boy, they knew how to get him going. He was fearful of, of uh, Caesar Tiberius. And if this man, Jesus, was actually opposed to him, then he had to have him executed. Now, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat down where? At the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. So at this point, Pilate was truly convinced that Jesus was a demigod, as I mentioned here, a person with supernatural powers. So to avoid his wrath, he again tried to let him go. But it didn't work. And now he knew that he had to bring the judgment of crucifixion here. But Pilate, like everyone else, was a worldling, wasn't he here? And he cared nothing about his relationship with God. And so he threw his relationship with God away for all eternity and chose to execute Christ. Now, this chair of judgment was called the pavement. Do you know archaeologists have found this in Jerusalem? Let me give you a picture of it. Uh, here it is in a, a lower area of Jerusalem. There's two pictures. One is the stone pavement that probably was the place where uh, Pilate judged Jesus. And I have a close-up of the stone pavement. Notice what's on there. In the pavement, the soldiers carved games. Why? Sometimes they had to wait hours for the judgment to uh, come uh, by Pilate. And they were out there waiting, so they just carved into all the uh, stone pavement and had little games to play. So all that's being said here in the scripture is truth, is that. All right, now, reading this verse, we come to a real problem. 
It was the day of preparation of the Passover. All right, I'm not going to go into that one. It was about noon, the translator of the New International Version said, Here is your king, Pilate said to Jews, to the Jews. Noon? It was 12 uh, p.m. This was the time period when Jesus uh, was being handed over to the Romans. It can't be. Something is wrong here. And the reason for that is Mark 15, 25 says it was the third hour when they crucified him. What do we answer? You know, uh, the one who laughs at the Bible says, oh, this proves the, iner the errancy of the Bible. You can't believe anything. It's all messed up. Well, the answer is in John 19, verse 14. Unfortunately, although I like the NIV, the NIV got it all wrong here completely. It was not noon in Roman timing or our timing today. And if you go to the other verses of scripture, like the English Standard Version, it translates it literally. It was the sixth hour, all right? This still is problematic here, but I'm going to get into that here. But a careful study of the biblical text helps us understand what was going on. Let's get back to a clock, all right, and timing. Now, on the top of the chart there between the blue and the yellow is dawn, 6 a.m. John says in the original text, it was the sixth hour. So the sixth hour refers to the events following Pilate's judgment uh, for Jesus to die. And then number three, look at there, the third hour was 9 a.m. our time. But look on the inner circle there and you'll see that it was the third hour. So Mark was correct. It was 9 a.m. when Jesus was crucified, Roman time, but it was the third hour of Jewish or biblical time. Now, what about that sixth hour? Well, the sixth hour, again, is Roman time and refers to the time when Pilate handed Jesus over and then began the process of another beating that Jesus was being prepared for the cross and then Jesus having to take the cross and walk all the way out of Herod's uh, palace there and walk up through the pathway to what is called the Hill of the Skull. That would take about an hour and a half or so uh, to uh, carry that very thing out. So these events, John say, are correctly understood when we put that time. Now let's put a little chart here showing a picture of Jerusalem. And I'm going to turn around here to show you. This is where, of course, the upper room discourse began. And Jesus walked all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where he was arrested and he was bound and he was taken back here to the house of Caiaphas, the house of Annas, and then ultimately to where Pilate was uh, staying and uh, there was the judgment. In between, they went to Herod Antipas' uh, palace. Herod uh, tried Jesus and found him innocent and uh, sent him back. I think my little pointer went out. No, there it is went back to Herod's palace, and now this is where we are and the preparations for Jesus to be crucified and then taken out to Golgotha, all right? So this map shows the pathway of uh, the taking to the hill of the skull. We'll get into that too. Now let's get to our passages. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? You know why he said that? Because he was so sick and tired of the Jews, he wanted to get them all riled up. He was now prepared to crucify Jesus to get him out of the way. And look at their answer. Now, this is amazing. The Jewish leaders, these are the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Jewish rulers and the people. They said, we have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered. Pilate was now, in a sense, completely unhinged uh, mentally. And in anger, he was just wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so they cried out. Now, when they said this, mind you, when they said this, the Jews committed the unpardonable sin against God because their king was God. Their king was the Messiah who was 
in their midst. And now declaring allegiance to Caesar instead of Yahweh, instead of Jehovah, their God, this was the unpardonable sin of unbelief. You see, there's no sin that keeps anyone out of heaven except unbelief. And that's what it was. Now, from a human standpoint, the trial of Jesus was the greatest crime uh, of, of the century. And from the divine viewpoint, it was the fulfillment of prophecy. It was the fulfillment of what God had planned before the world began. Because God said Jesus was going to be the Lamb of God who would pay for the sins of the world. But of course, talk about paying for sins. Pilate was going to pay for sin too. Pilate was going to pay for the sin of executing Jesus. And the Jews were going to pay for their sin of denying their own God and Messiah as well. And you know what's happened as a result of that? To this day, the Jews, uh, the Jewish people have terribly suffered for their rejection and unbelief of their Messiah. But you know what? God promised to preserve them as a nation. Even though they suffer, and many of them, if not almost all of them, die in their sins, God is still preserving their children for another generation to come on that day when Jesus will return and call the Jewish people to himself. God will preserve and save their, their children for a future day. But these, they would be eternally lost. Verse 16, finally Pilate handed him over to them, that is the soldiers, the bloodthirsty soldiers, uh, and uh, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Do you realize that not only were the Jews uh, turning themselves over in the trial that they faced of themselves and Pilate faced before God, but anyone who even has read about this and listens to this terrible uh, judgment and you do not side for freeing Jesus in the sense in your own heart, you will be guilty of the same sin of unbelief. The Bible says you too will join Pilate. You too will join the Jewish leaders. You too will join the nation of Israel. Now that's happened 2,000 years ago. They're all dead, but they are all in hell waiting the judgment of the lake of fire that one day is going to come from them. But one day it's going to come for all of us too. And the only thing we'll be able to say is, did I take Jesus as my Lord and my Savior? And as long as you have breath in your body, you have an opportunity to do that very thing. So finally, Pilate handed him over and the soldiers took charge. Do you realize what Jesus suffered from this point on? Uh, think about that. The hate-filled mobs of people all around him here that rejected Christ. All, all of them rejected Christ. Excuse me, I dropped my pointer here. But the gospel is right here because that's what the gospel is all about. Accepting Jesus Christ who is rejected by the world. And God wants each and every one of us to see that very thing. So I'm going to close on a verse of John that we go back to the very first chapter that John said. He, and I'm paraphrasing this, he, Jesus Christ, came to that which was his own, that is the Jewish people. But his own did not receive him. And yet to all, that's individual Jews and Gentiles, that's you and me today, all who receive him, specifically those who will trust and believe in his name as Savior and God, he gives them the right to become the forgiven child or children of God. Now, this church, a house for his name, is filled with people who've made that decision for Jesus Christ. They have personally invited Jesus into their life. They have personally received him as their Savior and as their Messiah God. And as a result of that, they have become the forgiven children of God. So the only thing that is left is for anyone who's listening to this message who has never received Christ. If it's you who are online, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing and just open your mind and heart and ask Jesus to save you because he will. He'll come by his spirit into any open heart that looks for him as their savior. And this is what happened. This is why he went to the cross. This is why he was crucified. The whole world condemned him, but you and I who receive him, he gives us the forgiveness of sins. So pray for Jesus to receive, be received as your God and as your Savior. And pray for God's promised forgiveness 
which he will give to all of us because that's what he paid for on the cross. God the Father poured out his wrath on the person of Jesus Christ for you and for me so that God no longer has wrath for you as a sinner. He has his grace and his mercy and his love. And so he offers it to a lost world of every generation and some will respond. I hope and pray you are among those. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the blessings we have. And as we understand that Jesus gave his all for us. And he gives us now the right to become the children of God through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, Lord, you opened my heart. You opened my eyes that one day long ago I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I know my brothers and sisters in the Lord here have done the same. But we still pray for a lost world. We still pray for our families. We still pray for maybe our spouses. We still pray for our children, Lord, who don't know Jesus Christ. So they will not suffer the terrible wrath that will come to a world of lost sinners. Because this wrath that Jesus suffered will not cover them when the wrath of God is exposed in eternity. I pray for them. And I pray for all. May Jesus Christ be Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's in his name we pray. Amen.